Okay, so as promised multiple times, we will get to a discussion on the inverse Laplace transform and why this all works. Okay, so Laplace transform. So there were many reasons why we haven't gotten to it until now. One of the reasons is it does fit in with the very last topic of the semester, which is going all the way back to the beginning, actually evaluating integrals. And this becomes a nice way to just go back to some of our integration formulas and lead into the very last thing. So I chose to end with a branch cut. Uh, some freedom in terms of how much detail I get into. I've made the decision to not get into full detail on the Laplace transform and to just give you the, the rough sketch, but go into full detail of the branch cut method as to how you would actually use this to do some integration. And you know, you can flip a coin as to which is the one you want to see, the technical details. You probably don't want to see the technical details for either one, but it is good to just see how difficult some of these calculations can become. For a lot of the Laplace transforms, a lot of these inversion theorems, what's often done is you use you know, a sequence of approximations to the identity. And there's a lot of you know, real technical stuff that needs to be done to make the arguments rigorous. How many of you have taken measure theory? So you might do things where you first prove things for step functions and then sums of step functions and you look at limits of stuff like that and you show you can approximate things very well and you can do a whole chain of arguments like that. We'd love to use in a lot of these things a point function where you know, I integrate you know, f of x, delta of x, maybe delta of x minus a dx and this will be equal to f of a at least if f is maybe continuous or maybe continuous and differentiable. So it's basically a point mass. The density is zero everywhere but at a where it's plus infinity. Well, this is not a function. This is a functional. It takes a function and it returns a value on the space function that maps f to numbers. What you can do is you can replace this point mass with a Gaussian or some other nice function with variance tending to zero. And the Gaussian with variance tending to zero is becoming a lot like an approximation to an identity. And the nice thing is you now have an infinitely differentiable family to look at with great decay. So you can make a lot of these arguments rigorous. So these are the two rough ideas. Okay. So let's recall the Laplace transform of some function f at s. We'll write big F of s. It's the integral from zero to infinity of f of t e to the negative st dt. And you need some condition so that this converges. And we'll say maybe it converges if the real part of s is sufficiently big. Which makes sense. You know, the larger the real part of s is, the more exponential decay I have as t goes to infinity. Maybe we have some assumptions on f. Maybe some kind of continuity assumption on f, some kind of growth assumption. You could also have the Fourier, I'm sorry, you could also have the Laplace transform going from minus infinity to infinity. This is very similar to the Fourier transform, which we often denote with a hat. And that would be the integral from, say, maybe minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the negative 2 pi i x c dx. And in both cases, we have a kernel involving you know, two variables. You integrate out one, and you're left with a function of the other. The only difference between these two is basically take s to be 2 pi i x c, and in which functions f you look at. So if you do a change of variables, these two are the same. You can look at Laplace transforms where you have your function going from minus infinity to infinity. Why might it be technically better to just look at functions on zero to infinity rather than minus infinity to infinity? You get decay. Yes, you get decay. If t is allowed to be negative, then in one direction it's going to be exponentially growing, in one direction it's going to be exponentially decaying. If you're going to do that, your function f now has to have massive decay in both directions. And this is one of the reasons why we look at something called the Schwartz space. It's a set of functions who decay sufficiently rapidly at infinity. Now the Schwartz space would not necessarily be strong enough here, because the Schwartz space only guarantees you polynomial decay at infinity. And here we have exponential growth. The goal here is I want to give you a rough sense of what's going on, what comes into play. So these two are all related. 
One of my favorite formulas is the Plancherelle formula. And it basically says the L2 norm of f squared is the L2 norm of f hat squared, where the L2 norm of some function g is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the absolute value of g of x squared dx. So what this tells you is that when you look at the Fourier transform, if f is a nice function, f and f hat have the same L2 norm. Why is this useful? Well, what is our biggest stumbling block in all of our work in you know, the central limit theorem and the Laplace transform? What is the thing that keeps us up at night? What's the difficulty? Uniqueness. We are deathly afraid that we could have two things that are mapped to the same. Well, let's say we have two functions f and g that are both mapped to the same transform. Let's say they're both mapped to f hat. Can you think of a good related function to look at? I'm sorry? The difference, right? And so what would f minus g be mapped to? Zero, right? If f is mapped to f hat and g is mapped to f hat, these are linear operators. So f minus g would be mapped to zero. Ah, now we can see why something like Plancherelle might be useful. You know, if you're looking at a space, if the norm is preserved, What's the only thing that could be mapped to zero? Zero. So this gives you some idea of how you might go about trying to prove. If we could somehow prove that the norm is preserved in the space that we're looking at, that's one way to get to uniqueness. Because if f minus g is non-zero on a set of measure zero, then its you know, square norm will be non-zero as well. OK, any questions on just the general setup? OK, so now what I want to do is I want to calculate a useful Laplace transform. So let's let um, f of t be e to the, I think I want to do it as e to the zt. I just want to make sure I use the right notation. Um, yes. So let's calculate the Laplace transform of f. So this would be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the zt, e to the negative st dt. Will this integral converge? And if so, where? What do you think? Any thoughts on what values of s might this integral be finite and well-behaved? Why s greater than 2? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you can trivially modify your s greater than 2. S greater than z. Now, of course, you can't say s greater than z in this class. Why can't you say s greater than z? Because greater than is not well-defined in complex analysis. So we have to correct it to you know, the real part of s greater than the real part of z. So if that's the case, we're going to have beautiful exponential decay. And this should be well-defined. So now, the integral will become the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative s minus z. So I apologize. The notation is standard. If I could avoid any two letters for variables, I would avoid s, which looks like a 5, and z, which looks like a 2. So I will try to maybe make it clear that this is an s. What is the antiderivative of this? So I, I want to integrate this with respect to t. What's the antiderivative?
and then we evaluate it at zero infinity. How do you know that this is the antiderivative? Do we have to worry that these could be complex numbers? I agree that if you take the derivative, this is what you get. This is the correct answer. One of the things I hate the most when teaching this class is the first like three or four weeks when we don't quite have Cauchy's theorem in full generality and we're always doing these baby steps as to when do we know an integral along a boundary curve of a nice function is zero. What, what do we know here? Well, we have a primitive and we have a path. And so the integral over the path is just the primitive evaluated at the endpoints. You know, the path is going off to infinity. Okay, we can take some limit. We can justify this. If you wanted to avoid this, we could split this up into the real and the imaginary fine, to a cosine and a sine, and integrate those pieces individually. And then when you would piece them together, you would end up getting this. And in the cosine and the sine piece, you would each get a uh, cosine of s minus z t. And so when you integrate that, you would get the s minus z in the denominator. And you would just piece everything together and you'd get this. So you can either do this using complex analysis or you can use Euler's formula, break this up, do the real integral, do the imagined integral, piece them together. All right, so what does this integral become? Uh, when we put, uh, oh, there should be a t here. When we put it in infinity, we're going to get zero because the real part is positive. So we only get a contribution at zero. The negative sign reinforces the negative sign from the lower boundary term, and we get one over s minus z. So what we've shown is the Laplace transform of e to the zt. You know, hopefully this is understandable notation as a function of s is just 1 over s minus z. Or if we take the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s minus z as a function of z, no, I'm sorry, as a function of t, that should be e to the zt. Because we, we just calculated the Laplace transform of e to the zt, is 1 over s minus z. So if we take the inverse of the Laplace transform, what we need to know is that we can't have two functions that have the same Laplace transform. So we've got to be a little bit careful. Hopefully that you, you are convinced that we do not have two different functions that will have Laplace transform uh, e to the zt, that we can do our subtraction game, that we have some idea of this length. This is the point that has to be done a little bit more carefully. I'm just trying to give you a, a rough, good feel of what's going on. OK, how can we use this? Well, fundamentally, the stuff we're going to do here is using complex analysis. I have not defined what the inverse Laplace transform is. You might have a guess. You know, If you think back to the Fourier transform, we replaced the negative sign in the exponential with a positive sign. So your first guess might be to just replace the minus s with just a plus s. It turns out that's close, but it's not exactly right. So let's calculate the inverse Laplace transform. OK. So we're given, say, the Laplace transform of f of s is our function big F of s. And we want to try to figure out what the inverse should be. What do we know about this as a function of s? What kind of function is this? We don't have that many words. What would you guess? What kind of function would you guess? Holomorphic, right? What do we study in this class? We study holomorphic functions. Why do we study holomorphic complex functions? Why don't we just study complex functions in general? Shoot, maybe this is too late in the semester to be thinking about this, that maybe I've been fixated on holomorphic functions for no reason. If so, my apologies. 
You can't say much, right? You can say an enormous amount about holomorphic functions. You have a huge arsenal of results to throw at them. So if we could look at holomorphic functions, we have a lot. This is holomorphic if f is nice. And so if little f is nice, we can differentiate under the integral sign, and we can just keep taking derivatives. Everything is going to work out without any trouble. OK, so now in this situation, we want to start using different results. So what results do we know about holomorphic functions? What's a good result about a holomorphic function? It's analytic, so we have an infinite series expansion. What else do we have that's useful? It's infinitely differentiable, which we have from analytic. There's something else we have. This should be one of your go-to results after taking complex. What do we know about any holomorphic function? It's related to the analytic. It's how we got to the analytic. What do we have? We have the Cauchy integral formula. This is one of the biggest differences between complex analysis and real analysis. If I have a differentiable function, I can write it as an integral over a boundary. What's nice about that is we only need to understand the function on the boundary, and we can move all the complex variable dependence into the middle. So again, there's an there's enormous number of topics we can choose. I'm choosing these topics deliberately to try to recap and emphasize what we've been doing all semester and just really drive home the points. All right, well, we can then write f of z as 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over some closed curve of f of s over z minus s d s. I think this is how I want to do it. I just want to make sure I'm using the same notation so that if we look up here, good. Uh, sorry, d. Um, oh, okay, I want to do it this way. I want my s to be on this side. OK. And I'll try to make sure that that does not look like a. OK, so now we have our definition like this. And then if I'm doing it this way, OK, I got my z minus s, 2 pi i. Excellent. What do I need to choose? I'm sorry? I need to choose a path. So the question is, what's a good path? Well, the normal Laplace transform is an integral along a line. So I probably want a line. And I want to be moving things in such a way that I'm going to have a lot of decay. So I'll post some notes online that talk about the decay you need. What we're going to do is, you know, here's some real number a. Here's a my, uh, plus i t. Here's a minus i t. And we'll draw a really big circle. So it extends out a little bit like this. In all of our calculations, what typically happens? When we're doing all of our quantum integrals, every single example, what's happened? Contribution yeah, the contribution of part of this has to go to zero. Which part do you think is the part that's going to go to zero? Yeah, the, the big circular part that's you know, far down. And so this is where you need some kind of decay on big F. So as long as big F has some decay, you'll be fine. And then as long as F has big decay, if A is sufficiently uh, far to the right, this integral will make sense. You'll have enough decay. The integral over this path will be zero. So. With enough decay, only vertical contributes as t goes to infinity. Now, if you notice how we're doing the integral on the vertical line, we're going in the opposite direction we want. We don't want to start off at infinity and come down. We want to start off at negative infinity and move up. That costs us a minus sign. Well, we can fix the minus sign by switching things down below. And so we get f of s 
is equal to 1 over 2 pi i, the integral from a minus i infinity to a plus i infinity, f of z over s minus z dz. What are we trying to find? So what's our goal? What are we looking for? What is the point? What are we searching for? If you can't answer this, this is not good. All right, what are we looking for? The inverse transform. So we have an expression for big F, which is the Laplace transform of little f, in terms of an integral. Which is the variable that matters at the end of the day, z or s? s. We've integrated out z. This thing on the right-hand side is just a function of s. So we now apply the inverse Laplace transform to both sides. So this is where you need some general theory that the inverse Laplace transform is well-defined. It's unique. We don't know what it is yet. We're just saying it's formally the inverse operator. We don't know what its expression is. But let's apply the inverse Laplace transform to both sides. So apply L inverse. What's the inverse Laplace transform of big F? Little f, right? So we'll get little f of t is 1 over 2 pi i. And the way you often write this is you just write a in parentheses. And this means you're integrating over the line where the real part equals a. This is really nice notation. Now we apply the Laplace transform inverse operator inside. So you need to be able to justify moving the operator inside the integral. As long as you have reasonable decay, that's fine. And then you'll get f of z times the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s minus z of t dt. If only we knew what the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over 1, <laughs> OK. That's why we did that calculation earlier. And we now get from our calculation earlier, this is 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over a. And now we'll get f of z e to the zt uh, dz. And that will be the inverse Laplace transform. What's nice is you can actually try to calculate stuff like this by trying to find residues and actually use this to maybe get nice close form expressions for the Laplace transform. And so now all of a sudden, all the tools in complex analysis are applicable. We talked about how the Laplace transform can be used to solve differential equations, if you can calculate the Laplace transforms. Well, one of the reasons we love complex analysis so much, or at least one of the reasons we should love complex analysis so much, is it converts integration, which is hard, to Taylor series experiences and finding residues, which on a relative scale, is easy. This is much better than doing integration. This is a huge gain. The difficulty is, at the end of the day, you need to invert and get back. We've seen this, or hopefully you've seen this in many math classes, that what you want to do is you want to convert to a space where the problem is easier, solve it there, and then convert backwards. Have we talked about finding the equation of an ellipse that's not parallel to the coordinate axes? Have we done that in this class? This is one of my favorite examples. And so how many of you remember the you know, equations of conic sections from high school? So conic sections. So if I'm feeling particularly generous, and I give you an ellipse, you know, here's minus a, here's a, here's minus b, here's b, it's x over a squared plus y over b squared equals 1. I'm still getting over the Patriot's loss. I'm still in a bad mood. And I'll give you now an ellipse that's rotated. How do you write down the coordinates of this? So this is a great way to just quickly review linear algebra and just link what we've been doing with something you've hopefully seen before. There's another way to write this. The way to write this is this is a x, y, 
x, y equals 1, where the matrix A is 1 over A squared, 0, 0, 1 over B squared. And these are now 2's, not Z's. So if I write it like this, I have a nice matrix equation. x transpose AX, or maybe you know, V transpose AV equals 1. If I didn't, if the a was just 1, 0, 0, 1, that would be the norm of v squared is 1. That's the equation of a circle. This is basically changing my norm a little bit. But the equation of an ellipse is very nice in a situation where it's parallel to the coordinate axes. The whole point about linear algebra is what's fundamental is not the matrix, but the operator. The matrix is the operator written in a specific base. You want to choose whichever base is most convenient to the problem and then convert backwards at the end of the day. Please make sure you convert backwards at the end of the day. There's a sad story about a NASA probe to Mars where all of the data was being measured in the metric system except for one subprocessor which was expecting data in the English system. And so the probe miscalculated how much thrust was needed for landing on Mars and it became a $25 million crater. And you see the scientists and engineers just watching the explosion happened because it was not using the correct scale. What coordinate axes would you love to use for this one? Yeah, what you have is just lean back like this a little bit. And if you lean back like this, if you make that U and you make this V, now it's very simple in UV space. And then you have a rotation. So maybe x, y, I apply some rotation matrix to it, and I'll get uv. Or uv is q transpose x, y. And so maybe my matrix you know, is lambda in uv space. And so I would get you know, uv uh, lambda uv equals 1. That would be the equation in the rotated space. And now I just know, well, uv is just q transpose xy. So I would get q lambda q transpose xy xy equals 1. There's your equation for the ellipse. There's your new matrix A. This is very similar to what we're doing with the Laplace transform. It's something you've hopefully seen time and time again in your math classes. Convert to a space where the problem is easy and then convert back. The big difference is the conversion here is trivial. It's just a nice orthogonal change of variable. The Laplace transform, the conversion factor, the conversion process is a lot worse. Not surprisingly, we're going deeper in mathematics. But it's the same general principle. You want to find a space where the calculation can be done easily. And the whole point of Laplace transforms, the whole point of complex analysis, is you want to convert from a hard process to an easy process. So long as you can then, at the end of the day, convert backwards. At the end of the day, if you're asked to solve a differential equation, you don't want someone to tell you, well, I don't know what the answer is, but I know what the transform of the answer is. Well, thank you, but I, I really want to know what the answer is to my differential equation. You need to convert backwards. And that's the whole point of all of this. Okay. Any questions on the stuff here? OK. So finishing up the Laplace transform, this allowed us to go back and you know, revisit integration. So what I want to do is I want to do uh, two complex integrals you know, to end the semester. The first one is going to be relatively painless. The second one is going to be relatively painful. And so what I think I want to do is I want to try to do just one of them today and then just set up the branch cut method for Friday. And then we'll go through the details there. So trig integrals. So let's say I give you the integral uh, from 0. I think I want to go 0 to 2 pi sine of x to the 2n dx. I just want to make sure I'm doing the integral I want to do. Why do you think I'm choosing to do it to the 2 nth power? Yes. Okay, that's the integral I wanted to do. Yes. 
Yeah, it was just 2n plus 1. Um, You, you, you could do that, but there's, a, there's an even better reason why I don't want to do uh, 2n plus 1. <laughs> so yeah, I, I agree with you that you could do the integral by change of variables. But what else, what do you notice about the integral if you have 2n plus 1? Zero. It's 0 because you would have an odd function that's symmetric about uh, pi. So there's really no point in spending the time doing this. Well. Just because we uh, don't have the change of variables working out nicely doesn't mean we can't try it. So let's call this i2n. And this is where it's a question of do you want to, do it, do you want to call this i2n or do you want to call it in? Maybe we'll call it in because we're only going to be looking at even numbers. But you have to choose how you want to do your indexing. We can still write it as the integral from 0 to infinity of sine squared of x sine of x to the 2n minus 2 dx. And then we can write this as the integral, oh, sorry, 0 to 2 pi. 0 to 2 pi, 1 minus cosine squared of x, sine of x to the 2n minus 2 dx. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine of x to the 2n minus 2 dx sorry, minus the integral from 0 to 2 pi, how do I want to write cosine squared sine of x to the 2n? I've got a cosine squared and a sine of x to the 2n minus 2. How do I want to group things? So I mean, I, I could just write it as cosine squared of x sine of x to the 2n minus 2 dx. But you should be looking at this. What should you be thinking of when you see something like this? I do apologize for going back to Calc 2. I know it's been a while. What made you sad when you had this integral? What, would you, what did you wish you could have? It's the holiday season. What's top on your wish list? You'd wish for a cosine, right? That's all you want for the holidays is a cosine factor. Am I being overly generous in giving you two? What should you do with this cosine squared? How do I want to view the cosine squared? If I do it as 1 minus sine squared, I'm going to just return to where I was. No. When you saw the sine of x to the 2n, it was screaming at you for something. Someday when you have kids, you'll hear, you'll know about this, you know, at this time of year. It's telling you it wants a cosine of x. What does the sine of x to the 2n minus 2 want? What does this factor want? Yeah, 2n minus 1 cosine. The 2n minus 1 is not a big deal. You know, that's something you easily give into your kid. Sure, you can have a 2n minus 1. The cosine, that's a more serious demand. Are we willing to give up one of the cosines? Sure. Then we can integrate this nicely by parts. So what's the first integral here? What is this equal? So the integral of sine of x to the 2n minus 2. If we're defining i n to be this, this integral is just i n minus 1. So we get i n minus 1 minus the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And we'll write this now as cosine of x times, and we'll put in a 2 n minus 1 sine of x to the 2 n minus 2 cosine of x dx. And since I put in a 2 n minus 1 here, I have to divide by 2n minus 1 outside. And now this is set up beautifully for an integration by parts. We let u equal cosine of x. dv will be 2n minus 1 sine of x to the 2n minus 2. Sorry. 
times cosine of x dx. And then we would get v when we integrate, what do we get? It should be like sine of x to the 2n minus 1. And if we take the derivative, derivative it's going to be 2n minus 1 sine to the 2n minus 2. The derivative of sine is cosine. So I don't have to worry about a negative sign. Good. And then we would get du derivative of cosine is negative sine. And so we would get i of n is i of n minus 1 minus 1 over 2n minus 1. Now we have the uv term. Well, what's the uv term going to be when we evaluate at 0 and 2 pi? 0. It's a periodic function. So the boundary term it cancels. And now we'll get v minus v du. Well, the minus signs reinforce. We still have another minus sign here. So we'll be left with then the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, and we get the sine of x to the 2n minus, sorry, to the 2n dx. So this is one of my favorite methods in mathematics. What is this integral equal over here? I n. So we get i n is i n minus 1 minus 1 over 2 n minus 1 i n. So I call this the bring it over method. If you've taken probability with me, you might have seen this when we were doing the memoryless processes in the basketball game. We have i n on both sides. And the coefficient is not 1. If the coefficient were 1, we'd be in trouble. But because it's not 1, we can solve for i n. And so we get, if we bring this over, uh, we get 2n over 2n minus 1 of i n is equal to i n minus 1. Therefore, i n is 2n minus 1 over 2n i of n minus 1. We have a recursion relation. Does it seem reasonable? that i n is smaller than i n minus 1. Yeah, if you think about what's going on, we have an extra sine squared. Sine squared is at most 1 and is typically smaller. So the integral should be getting smaller. And if n is huge, the amount that you're getting smaller by maybe isn't so bad. So now I'm not going to go through all the algebra. You can solve this recurrence relation. The, the solution is in my notes. After you do a lot of work, you get that this is equal to 2n factorial divided by 4 to the n, n factorial, n factorial. Well, a big chunk of this is now highly suggestive. And you would now get that this would just be, oh, and there's a 2 pi. And so you get that at the end of the day, it's 2 pi divided by 2 to the 2n, 2n choose n. All right. Not horrible. You have some good ideas here. You have a recurrence relation to solve. You can see the factorials emerging as you go through this. You might have to play some games. Uh, because here you're only going to have odds, here you're only going to have evens. That's where you're getting these powers of 2 from. And then maybe if I want to have a factorial, I should have everything. So maybe I fill in the stuff I'm missing. So I'll leave it as a nice exercise for you to go through and do the algebra or just you know, look online. This should not be how you expected to solve this integral. How should we have solved this integral? What should we be doing in this class? I'm sorry? Contra integrals, right? This is complex analysis. So this is called trig integration. So on the unit circle, z is e to the i theta. z bar is e to the minus i theta, which is also 1 over z. This is extremely useful. And it allows you to convert a lot of these trig integrals to contour integrals. It's a closed contour. 
If you look at it on the real line, I'm integrating from 0 to pi. But if I now look at it in the complex plane, I'm going around in a circle. So we would have cosine of z is equal to, I'm sorry, cosine of theta is equal to e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over 2. Sine of theta is e to the i theta, oh, so this is a plus, minus e to the minus i theta all over 2i. So on the unit circle, this is z plus 1 over z over 2. And this is going to be z minus 1 over z divided by 2i. So the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine, I'll use theta now instead of x, of theta to the 2n d theta, what should this equal? I'm going to be a little careful. Which is the easiest part to figure out? The sine of theta, the d theta, or the boundary? The boundary? OK, what does the boundary become? So it becomes the integral over the absolute value of z equals 1. The sine of theta is now going to be z minus z inverse over 2i to the 2n. And now we've got to figure out what d theta becomes. Well, if z equals e to the i theta, dz is i e to the i theta d theta. So it should be i z. OK, so let me see. Um, so then that means d theta should be dz divided by iz. And so this should then become dz over iz. OK. Is this an easy integral to solve? So I'll move over here just so we have more space. Oh, it's a good day for, for, for the board moving. So we now know that this integral is the same as the integral absolute value of z equals 1, z minus 1 over z to the, to the 2n. Now we, we have the 2i to the 2n, so that becomes a 4 to the n and i to the 2n is a negative 1 to the n, dz over iz. When you look at an integral like this, what do you want in front of the integral? You want a 1 over 2 pi i. So let's put a 1 over 2 pi i there. And of course, then we have to multiply by 2 pi i. Oh, life is good. i cancels the i over there. We've got a 4 to the end that's looking right. When you do this integral, how do you evaluate this integral quickly? What matters? Only the 1 over z term. <gasps> Come on. Life is good. We have a dz over z. How do you find the 1 over z term? Where does the 1 over z term come from? So this is going to be a polynomial. It's unfortunately going to have both positive and negative powers of z. But what's the only term that matters? The constant term. How do I get the constant term? I choose z n times, and I choose 1 over z n times. So the residue is just going to be the constant term here. 
So it's going to be 2 pi i, the sum of the residues. Well, the residue is going to just be 2n choose n. I do have, unfortunately, a negative 1 as well, right? I'm going to have a z to the n, a 1 over z, a negative 1 over z to the n. So I'll have a negative 1 to the n. I have a 4 to the n. I have a negative 1 to the n downstairs. I have a 1 over i. Well, the negatives cancel, the i cancels, and we get 2 pi 2n choose n divided by 4 to the n, exactly as before, but in far less work. So I thought it would be nice, you know, at the end of the semester to just go back and see how the tools we have can be used to attack a whole variety of problems. Notice that we are not evaluating the integral from 0 to some number x. We're not finding the antiderivative of sine of x to the 2n. So this is one of the disadvantages of these methods. You are not getting antiderivatives. However, given that most antiderivatives are not nice and are not nice closed form expressions, it's not surprising that we're not getting the antiderivatives. That's too much to hope for in general. What we can hope for is that nice complete integrals have good expressions. So the hope is complete integrals have nice expressions. And that turns out to be the case. This is just one of many examples, but this is the method of trig integration. And we're using a very nice fact that on the unit circle, z bar is just 1 over z. Things come out nicely. The d theta becomes the dz over iz. It all fits together wonderfully. And so you can now evaluate integrals like this without too much trouble. OK, any questions on this? So on Friday, what we're going to do is we're going to do the branch cut method. It is a long, painful integral. Uh, the first time I taught this class, I was expecting to only spend maybe five to 10 minutes on it. And then I realized, oh crap, my students have never seen estimations like this. And so I figured for the last day of the semester, let's do one calculation in full glory, glory details. You know, we're not going to skip anything. We're not going to say this is small. We're not going to say you can read another book. We will go through the calculation in full details once and just show you how it can be done. It can be used to give another proof of the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. So the branch cut method is very powerful. I'm deliberately going to choose an example where we don't need the branch cut method. Why do you think I will choose an example where we don't need the branch cut method? Yes, we can check our answer. You know, whenever you have anything that's this nightmarish, you want to be able to check your answer at the end. All right.